here's the way that we think about search. You know, there's there's all these opportunities across the bottom of the funnel. You, we can rank for things like you know New York's you know New York City SEO expert. We can also rank for things that are happening a little bit higher up in the decision making process, like um, you know Shopify support. Uh, so we rank for we rank for both of those terms. Where we've focused the majority of our efforts recently is that top of the funnel, you know, um, uh, searches that indicate that there's no interest in SEO, but that they are qualified to make uh, an SEO purchasing decision. So, welcome to the Magnificent Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top marketing experts in the world to keep you up to date on all the changes and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Nick Jordan. And Nick is a marketing strategist who helps CEOs, entrepreneurs, and executives identify opportunities across the funnel to drive revenue growth via organic search. He has helped companies generate incredible revenue by creating partnerships with the largest telecommunication and hosting companies in North America and their peers across Europe and Asia. He has funneled all of his knowledge and experience into the digital marketing sphere and has played a pivotal role in growing Logic Inbound's organic search traffic from just 500 to more than 100,000 visitors per month in a span of a year, outranking Instagram and Shopify for branded terms in the process. Nick has been featured on Inc.com, delivered keynote presentations at the Microsoft Hosting Summit, and spoken about marketing at Stack, Stacking Growth and Seattle Search Network. And today... We're going to be talking about demystifying SEO, how you can rank with all the technical, without all the technical know-how. Nick, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. That bio sounds a lot cooler when someone else reads it than me. <laughs> well, uh, I think that bio um, definitely built up the authority that our listeners need to listen to you about SEO and organic growth. And I also know that uh, definitely one of the most intimidating things about SEO is are the technical aspects of it all. So we're going to be demystifying all of that and, and allowing people um, uh, to rank without having all that you know technical development type of skill sets, which I'm telling you is probably intriguing people right now. So kind of just to jump in, you know, I know this, you know, this topic is of utmost importance, or, or at least it should be, right, Nick, to most businesses. So I would love to just dig in and, and see how companies can accomplish this. You know, just love to start out with having you give like a, a, a just big, broad 10,000 foot overview for the top ranking factors in the current marketing landscape, and then we'll dig into some details. But uh, yeah, if you could kind of just give us that overview real quick, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I'm I'm super excited to demystify uh, search marketing because I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there in terms of what actually drives the impact that businesses are looking for. <clears throat> you know, you can Google what drives search you know rankings, and you're going to find Backlinkio, and there's a 200 different ranking factors that he claims you know are important to where your website appears in the search results. And we found that that's absolutely not true. Um, we focus on maybe four, five, six activities, and we're able to drive ninety uh, percent of the outcomes that we achieve. And then there's another, you know, couple handfuls of activities that drive that remaining ten percent. And when you know, when you actually break down how search marketing works, it's it's actually really intuitive, and it makes a lot of sense if you know what Google's goals are. Google's goal is to show the highest quality most relevant search result for any given search query. So the most relevant and highest quality. If you can align your website with those two things, Google's not only gonna rank you all day, but they're gonna rank you over more powerful domains that have been in business and are more authoritative than you are. It's funny you say that. I am always defending Google and Facebook. And the reasons I defend them, it's like, it's like the opposite of um, don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah. It's like uh, love the game. You, you know, love Facebook, love Google, because they are bound to their money makers, and their money makers are not the businesses. Their money makers are their audience. And mm -hmm. if they have a crappy product, uh, if they have crappy search results, which is why five or six years ago they were getting lots of crappy search results, uh, they're gonna they're gonna redo it because the audiences are like, well, screw this, I'll go to Bing or somewhere else to find my searches, right? So they're bound to do the right thing. So believing that, 
just logically, just believing that means align yourself with them. So and, I'm right there with you. And, and I just want to expand on what you mean by bound to providing good search results. Are they like, you know, ideologically bound? Are they ideologically you know, bound? No, it's a hundred billion dollars a year in AdWords revenue that they're protecting. As soon as they stop displaying the highest quality, most relevant search results, people are going to use other browsers. It leaves a gap in the market to take some of that hundred billion dollars a year in revenue. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. And same with Facebook. All these, yeah. all these changes you've seen on Facebook are because the users are saying, I'm going to bounce from this. And they're yeah. like, no, 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 no. Don't bounce. Let us make you happy. Yeah. So that's just is what it is. So believing that, I love that you, you know, you've identified that. Um, and, and, and also, I do want to touch on the current landscape and the importance of SEO. Uh, just recently, you've heard, um, and, and sometimes it's just people want to say something new, I think hurt sometimes you know they want to be different because they're tired of saying seo is important so now you hear people saying well there's diminishing returns with seo because google's taking up too much real estate with a featured snippet and now they're serving four ads instead of three so there's not as much space the top search ranking results are sometimes uh not getting as much as they use yada 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 Google's moving into weather google's moving into sports tickets Google's All of that. moving into you know best so, dog you, breeds exactly touch on that because i'd love for you to clear the air there uh I, you know actually i just watched that same presentation by Rand fishkin at brighton seo as as you probably did i thought you know typically i don't like keynotes because they're super high level and fluffy but this was actually super interesting in in the route that google's going Rand talks about how you know, they started off with the featured snippet and doing it for a very sub, small subset of searches. And they're, they're moving into all sorts of stuff all the way down to, you know, best dog breeds or French dog breeds. Uh, they're, they're stopping people from clicking into the website. But to summarize Rand's talk, you should definitely watch it if you haven't. Um, at Brighton SEO is that uh, he thinks that search is going away, but we have a 10 year time frame. And it might actually increase in that time just because more people in the world are getting online. And so despite the decrease in, in clicks per search, he thinks that the, the industry is going to continue to grow for at least 10 more years. Okay. Well, that, that's, I think that's enough of a window to say, let's keep going. I, I still I so, so. do not believe that even that will happen. Uh, I think SEO will always be something that people rely on as an authority. It's, I mean, if you're ranking, it's, you always think, well, there's a reason they're ranking, which means they're probably a good company. Yeah. So I think that's always going to play a part, but that's yeah. just me. But let's say I'm wrong and I still have a decade. Well, that's a long time in the marketing world. All right. Awesome. So I think we both deem this to be something important that we need to concentrate on. We're talking to an SEO expert. So let, let's move towards helping our, our listeners accomplish getting their sites, sites ranked starting at the top. Where should companies start or what are the first things they should do uh, to get going here? Like what are the first couple action items that uh, you would suggest or advise people to start doing? Yeah, so I'm going to assume that they already have a website and they already have a business that can monetize the organic search traffic that they generate. If you don't have those two, well, you should talk to someone else. Um, so <clears throat> here's the way that we think about search. You know, there's there's all these opportunities across the bottom of the funnel. You, we can rank for things like, you know, New York's, you know, New York City SEO expert. We can also rank for things that are happening a little bit higher up in the decision-making process, like um, you know Shopify support. Uh, so we rank for we rank for both of those terms. Where we've focused the majority of our efforts recently is that top of the funnel, you know, um, uh, searches that indicate that there's no interest in SEO, but that they are qualified to make uh, an SEO purchasing decision. So you know, that's either a marketer or a founder. And they're making searches for things like uh, Shopify support, contact Instagram, is Shopify safe, you know, Magento versus WordPress, um, things that kind of indicate that they run a business that would benefit from search. Now, I mean, you're an expert here, and I don't know if you realized it, but you, you really just went a deeper level there. You were talking about getting ranked for, you know, parts of the funnel that are obviously more than one word, uh, you know, they're going to be longer tail. Um, sounds like even like multiple, like extra long tail searches. How, how does one even begin to find out what the hell they want to rank for? Like how, yeah, how do you go? What's your process there? Because I assume that's a starting point, right? I want to rank wolf for what? And you, uh, you, you really, um, seem to 
to talk to that. So if you can, that'd be great. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the issues today, and, and you probably see this all the day with the clients that you work with in your content marketing campaigns, is that people create content from the gut. Uh, I think my prospect would like this. I think my, you know, my ideal client type would like this. Uh, but the issue is, is they don't have very good distribution, right? They have a Facebook page with a thousand likes and they have an email list with a thousand emails. And when you push the content that you've invested money into both of those channels, you're going to get very little return because only 2% of your email list is going to click the link to see the content. And only, you know, 10% of your social audience is, is you know, Facebook is actually going to show the content to and all of those people are already familiar with your brand. You're not putting net new prospects into the funnel. So when we think about search, we work backwards with our distribution channels and, and what way we have the, the sort of content um, and how we're going to distribute that. Our, our core competency is in search. And so we always work backwards from what people are searching for and then deliver content that answers that question. We never create content from the gut. And when you create content based off of what our people are searching for, you end up creating this, this asset. It's no longer an expense, it's an asset because this asset is bringing you new traffic, new leads and new revenue month after month after month, six months, 12 months, 18 months down the line. Well, awesome. So I, I see you're, you're sharing your screen on, on your Keyword Explorer with Ahrefs. Um, walk us through your process. I think this is a very important part. And I would love for you to kind of do it from a frame of mind of, you know, when you just were getting going, not like, don't assume anything is known here because th this one part we could spend a little bit of time on because again, if you don't get this right, then, um, then you're going to be going down the wrong, the wrong, the wrong lane the whole way through. So how, how did you identify what you wanted to rank for? You know, is, was it just more of a talking it out? Was it technical? Was it using keyword explorers like this? How did you go about that? Great question. So the first thing we started with, who typically hires our company? And it's always marketers at bigger organizations and founders at smaller organizations. So then we wanted to think about what kind of content are they searching for? And yeah, they're searching for SEO content, but that's probably the most competitive content on the internet to, to rank for. And we didn't really want to compete in such a competitive space. We, wanted to com we didn't want to compete uh, with, with strong competitors. And so what we did was we targeted platforms that we know business owners are using. So this is things like Shopify, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and we create content that aligns with what they're searching for. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an example of Shopify. What I do is I start with something I call a seed keyword. And this is the platform that I, wanna, I think I want to create content about. And I'm going to go ahead and click search. Now, what we're going to end up finding is that there's probably over a million ways that people are using Shopify in their search query. Actually, not even close. 250,000 different ways that people are using Shopify in their search query, but that's still too many. So I want to figure out, you know, what do I, you know, what informational questions are people asking? And so one of the tricks we kind of stumbled into was ranking for contact Instagram. So I'm going to open up a um, contact Instagram. So we ended up jacking this search query from Instagram. And so the, you know, all the people that are searching contact Instagram actually land on our page. And some of them are not consumers, they're businesses, they're national brands, uh, they're, they're, they're people that can afford us. But the issue that we ran into is that there was too much consumers. And so the next iteration, we said, we're going to focus on support and help related terms for platforms that are only doing transactions with businesses. And and Shopify is one of those platforms. Wait, wait, back up. That thumbnail you did, so you addressed the issue to stop getting, I guess, like low qualified leads is people by saying, oh, if people just want to contact Instagram, you go ahead and just put it right there. How to contact. So all those people didn't bother you. Is that why y'all did that? No, no, they, they still bother us. Uh, we had to implement <laughs> a ton of tricks to, to get them to not bother us. So, uh, for example, our phone number is displayed on every page on the website except for this page. Uh, we have pop-ups that don't happen on this page. Uh, and I'll have to check recently, but I think we even restricted the navigation so people could not get to our homepage and then call us. Um, Interesting. It, it, it did drive business traffic. We talked to a bunch of businesses uh, that, that needed help with their Instagram. And, and one of our core strategies for growing as an agency is referrals. And so we can't help them with their Instagram, but I know 10 guys who can, I refer them out to the 10 guys who can, they send me SEO leads back. And so we kind of use 
this lead thing that we've created Great. Is, a, is a you know a growth strategy. Awesome. So, All right. So go ahead. Oh, sorry. So I was just I was just recapping. Uh, it worked, but too much consumer traffic. Let's focus on things that we know don't have consumer traffic. Shopify is one of those. Um, and we wrote a ton of content here. So we started off with e-commerce comparison articles because we thought that um, you know people that are researching these things might be marketers that are on like Magento or WordPress or, or some legacy system. They have this existing e-commerce business and their and their boss told them they got to move somewhere else. So there's all sorts of you know comparison articles. Um, I think we'll Google Wix versus Shopify and we're somewhere you know on the first page. And we just started creating content that aligns with these informational uh, questions that uh, we know business owners are searching for. And that's that's been the primary driver to get to a hundred thousand visits a month. Now that we've hit that you know vanity goal, we're really focused on um, conversions as well as bottom of the funnel searches. One of the things that we felt was super important, and you know this as someone who provides SEO, is, is most people selling SEO uh, are selling a service that they haven't figured out to make work for their own business. <laughs> for that reason, 99% of SEO agencies don't rank for any relevant keywords. Isn't that funny? It's, it blows my mind, and it's, it's crazy that businesses trust another business who can't even make the service they're selling work for themselves. That, that is so funny. That's so funny. I told you we're rolling out that new product and first things first, we're applying it to ourselves. Yeah. And I, and I have actually, I think I remember even talking to an SEO or, and he's like, well, I don't need to rank for myself. And I was like, all right. Why make do it. your clients trust you? Yeah, I don't. Okay. But yeah. I, I have heard that I, and it's a thing and I, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. It's follow this that if you're going to work with an SEO or have them show you where they're ranking, <laughs> because if you're not ranking for yourself, I'm with you. And, and for whatever reason, you know, it's such an easy differentiator. We didn't want to be another SEO company that, that didn't consume our own services to generate business value for ourselves. So we, we grew our traffic, hundred thousand, 12 months. Uh, and now it's time to focus on, uh, you know, conversions and, and bottom of the funnel. So we're targeting things like, um, well, let, let, let's let let's let's stop right there real quick, and then we'll start moving down the funnel, right? You know, yeah. on the strategy side. You mentioned again. We, we talked about all the tech. You know, the podcast was titled "Demystifying SEO." You know, how to rank with all the technical know-how. Let's back up. Bring up a keyword tool called Ahrefs. Now, with this being said, what, the kind of technical know-how we're talking about is all that that back end, the the tagging. Um, you know, making sure you know, your URLs are correct. And, and let me just say that there is always going to be some technical, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, there's going to be some technical know-how here, but um, it's not as difficult as you think. Um, and it's going to be about producing great content. Any, and Nick say yes or no to this, any SEO agency that you go to that does not utilize content outside of if you have some massive contest or a scholarship program or something super crazy unique that's gonna, you know, hundreds <laughs> the thousands of sites are gonna link back to you because you have this big program, like that'll help in some way. But in general though, you must be utilizing content. Is that a correct and fair statement? Absolutely, SEO is 80% content, both on your site and then securing backlinks and creating content on other people's sites. Okay, now let, let's get to that in a second. Creating the content. Are you simply creating the content or are you distributing it? Are you getting, are you getting, um, are, are you generating traffic? Because chicken or the egg, right? So now that you all are ranking, you can put up something. That thing's going to rank faster organically, so you're going to get the organic traffic. But until that moment in time happens, you got to make it happen. So do you suggest that people, when they produce this content, do drive it through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter to, to generate traffic? Because I, I think there's obviously on-page factors. You talk about relevancy. Well, that's only going to be told to Google by how much long people spend on your page or how long they spend on your site, right? So how do you go about it? Can you talk about that part of the equation? Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, going back to Google showing the highest quality, most relevant search results, uh, you know, one of the ways that they measure quality, they can't actually synthesize your content despite all their, you know, AI, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's not that sophisticated. One of the, you know, one of the primary ways they determine quality is user engagement metrics, time on site, pages visited, 
uh, general engagement with the site in general. And what they do is they compare those user engagement metrics to the other people on the first page. And if you can send a bunch of social traffic and it engages really well and even better than the competition that Google's already showing, what they're gonna do is they're gonna prioritize your site, they're gonna move it to the front page a lot quicker, and then they're gonna test it to see how it actually performs against those other organic search results. And if you're you know, better, they're gonna they're gonna keep you on the first page. So what I'm hearing is it's definitely great to distribute and drive people to your page. I mean to your articles through you know social advertising, but make darn sure that's targeted social advertising. It'll it'll be counterproductive if you're just blasting it out there, you know, and and people are bouncing. That's gonna hurt you. So Absolutely. it's about content producing it consistently. I am sure you're gonna touch on, and then making sure it's badass, right? So people will engage with it, and then you gotta. To get going, you got to put some ad dollars behind it to drive people. All right, keep on going. You were mentioning about going further down the funnel. Great. So I, I think I kind of skipped an important step to demystifying SEO. I want to show you kind of the process that I took from ideation, identifying things that my qualified prospects are searching for, to actually creating that content. And I'm going to use those examples of contact Instagram and as Shopify safe um, to really highlight uh, uh, how important the, the relevance and the quality is um, and how unimportant those technical SEOs and even, you know, even backlinks are, are just a small, small piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, I always like to say you can send a million backlinks at thin content and it won't rank, or you can have an awesome piece of content with zero backlinks and it'll rank. Um, so while backlinks are generally, you know, helpful, it's, it's definitely, you know, lower on the priority list. So I want to show you how we were able to beat Shopify and Instagram for both their branded terms, spending less than like fifty dollars on on backlinks. Um, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna first talk about relevance. So relevance is derived the closer the closer your page aligns with what people are searching for, the higher relevance you have. And relevance is derived from only a couple of different places. It's not uh, again Google's not an AI. It looks at specific uh, attributes on your page to determine how relevant it is. These are things like the URL, uh, the things like the meta title, which is this thing, the meta description, which is this block of text, as well as the H1s and the H2s on the page. Um, uh, so, you know, things like the H2s here um, and the, the, the H1. So stepping back. What we're gonna see is that Shopify's competitive article loses in every single category that's important. Uh, relevance as well as things like content length and structured data, that's also very important. Google knows that websites that contain structured data and that go above and beyond of just putting blocks of paragraphs generally tend to have better user can, engagement. Can you define structured data for our listeners? Yeah, it's lists, tables, bullet points, tables of contents, um, uh, you know, things you of that think, nature. Do you think that's really mainly a user experience driven deal? I, you know, my theory is, is two things. One, uh, it does create a better user experience, which drives better user engagement. But also when Google crawls it and it notices you have structured data, uh, um, it, it kind of indicates that based off of their trillions of prior searches, your content is higher quality than someone who doesn't include structured data because it's more work to do it. Gotcha. So ba bottom line is do bullet points, graphs, charts, I mean, that's the takeaway. Yeah, tables of contents are super important. Embed YouTube videos and then reference, you know, put a reference section at the end and link out because content that links out to other high authority content is generally better content than, than content that doesn't. So mm -hmm. Google has all these heuristics off of their 20 years of search history and, and you know, is our content better? Uh, I'm not even sure, but Google seems to think so and that's that's what matters to me. So yeah. let me kind of let me kind of walk you through why our content is ranked above Shopify. So the first is the URL. It's exactly what people are searching for. Is Shopify safe? And I know that because I did keyword research to figure that out. Where Shopify's URL is, you know, payment, shipping, fulfillment, Shopify payments really safe, a bunch of numbers. And, and those things are not relevant to what people are searching for. The, <clears throat> the next thing you'll notice is um, when we actually look at the description, you know, Shopify just pulls this from the post, the form post. When you look at the description, it's also not very relevant. It says save Shopify payments, and you know, and that's that's not as good as is what we have going on here. So we mentioned Shopify multiple times. 
We have safe a couple times, you know, safe here, safest, uh, blah, 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 blah. Anyways, the relevance is, is higher in our meta description. And then when we get on page, we'll see that Shopify has an H1, but they don't have any kind of structured data. They don't have pictures. They don't have tables of contents. They don't have list bullet points, um, any of that stuff. And the content is relatively light as well. Whereas if you look at our page, you see that we have pictures, you know, we bold stuff. Um, we, uh, we have a table of contents. We have bullet points. Um, we have a bunch of different H2s. Uh, and, you know, we have a lot more content, a ton more content. And for all of those reasons, between the relevance and the higher quality content, Google has decided that we're a better search. All right. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, what's what's really awesome to hear is this can be accomplished with all the technical know-how. Granted, there's going to be some. You need to know where to put a URL. You know, uh, you know, you know, some, you know, the tagging. I mean, all, all of this stuff can be accomplished by somebody showing somebody who knows how to, you know, lay out a blog page one time. So, I mean, it's not that technical. I mean, granted, it feels technical if you don't know what those things are, but I'll just tell you it is on the lower rung of the technical scale. It's something that everybody pointed out they can accomplish moving forward. So there are those things, but outside of that, it's really, and then obviously the keyword research, you're going to need a tool to do that. But after that, it really comes down to a lot of this, I mean, no pun intended here, it's just logical, right? And you need to make sure that what you're writing about is, uh, and what you're titling that, and all of that is congruent and aligned. And then we're hearing, here's some here's specific things to make your content better, but make sure the content is badass, you know? And, and, and it can be that simple. And I know that from a couple other people who simply have written fantastic content and they rank the hell out of stuff. Now they're consistent with it, but every piece they put out is fantastic. So, uh, and then the relevancy is making sure you're not trucking anyone. I mean, is that a fair kind of overview of what we've discussed this far, Nick? Yeah, you're right. And it's, 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 you know, might seem technical if you haven't done this before, but this is the least technical thing you can do when it comes to marketing in general. Pretty Just much. Pretty much. All right. Um, keep going. All right. So, you know, if I were to also um, show you that uh, to really, you know, drive it home with the contact Instagram, I, I'm going to spend just, you know, one minute aligning what I showed you with the Shopify and the general theory to this article as well, because it does outrank Instagram, which is one of the strongest websites on the internet. You know, exact match query. How do I contact Instagram? Uh, and I'm going to expand on one other subject that I forgot to include because we don't just want to rank for the same or one core keyword, David. We want to rank for all of the variations of the core keyword because people just don't type contact Instagram. They type Instagram help, Instagram phone number, Instagram email, uh, you know, all sorts of variations. And, and most of the time, the number of variations combined adds up to more than the core keyword. So your search campaign isn't successful if you're just ranking for one good keyword. You want to rank for 100 good keywords. Um, related to the search. And what you do is you sprinkle all of those variations into those things that drive relevant. So the H1s, the H2s, the, the meta title, the meta description, the URL, all of those things. And <clears throat> like the Shopify article, what we're going to see is that Instagram's uh, competitive page on help isn't very competitive because they actually don't mention help once in the meta description. Um, their, their title isn't very well optimized. And then when you actually click on, there's, you know, it's very thin content. This is, you know, very hard to, to rank. It ranked naturally until we came along. And then you'll see that, you know, all sorts of pictures and bullet points and bolded words and lists. And now we have a bunch of comments. So the content length that we've, um, you know, added to the article is, you know, we created this huge moat because anyone who's coming on this page is going to also be reading the comments to see if anyone else had the same issue as them. And we ended up solving it. Awesome. Now, to, to talk about that, what, what we call, though, you talk about, you know, ranking for, you know, within a main term, ranking for all kinds of other other phrases, other terms, other search queries. We, we, I've heard those be referenced as clusters. Uh, we call them pillars or, or cornerstone pieces of content. So, you know, when we're putting together a content plan and the same thing basically is hand in hand with an SEO plan, 
because you know we identify the three, the two, three, four, five main. Like I said, we call them pillars. So uh, again, I think the most common vernacular is clusters. So is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, me uh, not being on our service delivery team, I just called it, you know, keyword variations. But um, you know, when I look at the URL of the tools that we have that help automate some of this research, it's called cluster. So you must be, uh, you must be right there. So on that note, then to describe this, what we're talking about is like a let's just break it down to like a business that has multiple services, like a dental office that has crowns and blah, 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 blah. Would you suggest making sure at least on, on setting up the site architecture and everything is have those service pages live on their own. You have your content that's going out. Obviously each of those individual pages needs to be fantastic with a piece of content, you know, about that service, but then be writing in and around various topics that align or fall under that umbrella, that cluster umbrella with the blog pages linking back to those, to those service pages. Is that kind of how you all do it or am I off base? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty close. So, you know, we actually really, we're not sure whether we need a landing page or a blog post uh, for a lot of the, the, the keywords that we're targeting. And so we always just Google it and see what Google prefers, right? Google will tell you what it likes and we'll see that eight out of the 10, you know, results for a particular page are blog posts. So we're going to write a blog post. And if it's the opposite for landing pages, we're going to write a landing pages. Now, to get a little bit more sophisticated and help people along with this process, one of the things you're going to run into is, do I need two pages to rank for this content or can I rank with it for one, right? Do you ever, do you ever ask yourself, all right, how similar can I get? Can I rank black shirts and can I capture black striped white shirts in that same article on black shirts or do I need to create a dedicated article for black shirts with white stripes? Um, and we used to do a lot of manual tedious research on driving that insight. Uh, it used to take hours and hours and hours and it wasn't very good use of uh, our time or our client's time. And so we built a tool to automate it. It's called the keyword grouping tool. Once you find, let's say for example, I wanna target all of the ways that people are searching for Shopify support and help and things of that nature, what you're gonna do is you're gonna export this list and import it into this tool. And this tool is gonna actually group the keywords and the variations of the core keyword based off of what's already ranking for what. And so we can see that if I have one page on US Open Tennis, I can also rank for all of these keywords. But you'll see that I need a specific page for US Open Tennis 2017 to rank for the 17 keywords. Okay. And so, yeah, so I guess my question then for our listeners are, say you want to rank for U.S. Open Tennis. So that's going to be a key page. You know, is it going to be a landing page, blog page? To me, those are somewhat the same unless you're talking about a conversion landing page that doesn't have navigation bars, but mm -hmm. it's just vernacular, right? So then, then are you going to be writing about U.S. Open 2017, you know, brackets, and then you know, having different articles that then point to this main landing or blog page, is that, or are you looking to have one article incorporate all this stuff uh, when you're writing, or is it both? That's a, that's a great question. So first we have to figure out is how much content we need to create, right? If we want to rank for all of the U.S. Open tennis searches, and there's a lot of them, you know, there's at least 20 here, it turns out that we actually have to create two different pieces of content, one for this year and one for last year's. And then once we create the content, you know, we're going to be using all of these things as variations in those places that drive relevancy. So the URL, the title, the meta description, the H1s and the H2s. So we might just, you know, well, I'm not going to get too deep there, but think of these as you have to use all of these in the, the, the real estate that drives relevance to be able to rank for all of these keywords with one page about US Open Tennis. But we talk about consistency. It's not just about writing one article and hoping it gets ranked because you do it all the right way, right? I mean, we're gonna, you need to consistently be writing about US Open Tennis 2017. I mean, that's how, that's my understanding of it all. You know, I guess some, some people could have a ton of a huge domain authority and a lot of traffic and instantly an article will get ranked. But let's take ourselves back to the people who don't have 100,000 of organic searches like Logic Inbound does. And we're talking to people just getting going and they have no presence or they're not ranking at all. 
Um, and again, I'm trying to demystify all of this, right? And I don't want to lead people astray that um, don't have some of the benefits other people have where, hey, you just write an article, you do everything right, and then bam, it's going to rank. Um, SEO is a forever thing. I, I mean, granted, it's not like you stop producing SEO efforts or content and it's going to drop off, but it'll go, go down slowly. It's going to go up slowly and it's going to go down slowly. So, but the upwards part of all this, at least my understanding of this is being consistent with it all and continuously putting out content. Do you see it differently than that? Yeah, yeah, I do. I would say, you know, consistently putting out content is, is not something that we actually consider whatsoever uh, when we're executing on our own search marketing campaign or our client search marketing campaign. But you did have a good point. Not everybody's website is as strong as ours. So while we can write one article about US Open Tennis 2017 and rank for all of these things, that's not true for weaker, weaker domains and websites. And what they want to do is they want to hyper focus in on, on you know, the more relevant, right? I'm going to, let's, let's go to Tennis Elbow. I'm going to write an article on Tennis Elbow. I'm going to include all these as H2s and variations, and I'm going to rank for all of these things. But if you're, if you're a weaker website, you might just want to create a whole article on symptoms of Tennis Elbow, and then a whole article on Cure Tennis Elbow, because you're going to be more relevant than me, right? I'm not going to, I only have limited real estate, and I have to fit in all of these words. You can be more relevant by just focusing your entire content on a couple of them. Awesome. Um, but the thing you have to be you know, aware of is that uh, it's really easy to have pages compete against each other, and none of them rank. Um, so you have to be super selective in, in, in how you segment the articles. So for example, how to cure tennis elbow and treatment for tennis elbow, that probably wouldn't be two articles. It'd probably be one because even though they're searched slightly differently, they're the exact same question where symptoms of a tennis elbow is a completely separate question. Yeah, I hear um, you. So, so the you know I know we're I know man this is a really fun podcast. I, I hope everybody's getting a lot of value. I'm having a great time, but I also know we're running over. So I want to leave um, your audience with with one more strategy that they can use to um, you know grow their search traffic, and that's the offsite portion. You know, like I said, uh, it's it's one of the least impactful things, but it's also necessary for a lot of targets that we're aiming for. There's a lot of easy ways to build links. Um, and I'm going to talk about the one that I use to appear on your podcast. So we have an outreach manager. He reaches out. We, 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 we have this list of podcasts that we found in this book called Ace the Game. It's by a growth hacker. And one of the value adds was, was a list of podcasts. Yours was in it. And oh, cool. we have an outreach manager that's reaching out to all of them. Um, and we're going, hey, you know, I'm uniquely positioned to talk about X, Y, and Z. I think it align well with your audience because I see you do a lot of X. And I've been on 20 podcasts in the last, you know, couple months. And every time I'm on a podcast, uh, I get a backlink. And so one of the easiest ways and one of the least expensive ways uh, your audience can build backlinks is also go on podcasts because guest blog posts are expensive. You have to pay a writer to write a thousand words. It costs us a couple hundred bucks. But the podcast is just, you know, 30 minutes or in this case, you know, an hour, an hour and 15 of my time. Awesome. Great point. So let's recap. We're talking about, well, I'll let you recap, Nick. Why don't you recap the top takeaways of if somebody's getting going, let's, you know, some of the technical know-how, there's going to be some of that. But in general, here are the main things that we need, you need to get going with right away to start ranking with your Absolutely. Organic. If you're getting going... And even if you're not getting going, if you have a website that's pretty strong, it's just not generating traffic, you got to focus on creating highly relevant, high quality traffic. Some of the biggest issues I see is, is massive websites that just don't have any content that align with what people are searching for. And despite the power of the domain, they don't gather any organic search traffic. So highly relevant, high quality content that aligns with what people are searching for means you just invested into a content asset that's going to produce traffic leads and sales for your business 6, 12, 18 months in the future. Mm -hmm. The rest of the stuff, you know, the technical SEO, the, the, for, you know, the, the, the internal forwarding and, and the backlinks, you know, less than 20% of the outcomes that we deliver on. Excellent. Well, Nick, thank you so much. Uh, this is a very confusing topic for many, many people, and I, and I think you've really um, simplified it in a very good way. 
uh, and really told people where, and, and we always, I mean, how many books are there about the 80, 20 rule and the 80, 20 rule applies to yeah. life. And it applies to pretty much everything. And it looks <laughs> like it applies to SEO as well. You know, a 20% of your efforts are going to drive 80% of your results. Uh, and I think this might even be a 90, 10 rule according to Nick here, as far as SEO goes. So thanks so much for your time. And how can people continue to learn from you? Yeah, definitely. So uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook, Nick from Seattle. All one awesome. word, Nick from Seattle. One other thing I want to shout out is we are developing these tools for internal use, uh, but we don't. We want to see if other people would like them. So if you're into SEO and you want to you know, implement what you've learned today, go to tools.logicinbound.com, and I'd love to know if it's actually useful for people that don't work at Logic Inbound. All right. Until next time, Nick. Thanks a lot, Thank, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast. Feel free to go to magnificent.com forward slash blog to see the show notes for this interview, as well as those from many other of the world's top marketing experts. Have a great day.